Hi, uh, welcome to Van's reading. Uh, I'm doing international bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. Hopefully this reverses itself. Um, we're going to go on part one, two systems, chapter one, the characters of the story. Now, I hope you enjoyed my reading. I will be a little bit off sometimes because I'm not going to be editing this out. This is more of a hobby. And it will be for me to force myself to read more books and uh, it will be interesting for other people to you know watch me maybe comment in the comment section and uh, you know give it a like if you have if you like the reading i do and uh, yeah make sure you comment your thoughts on this chapter that i'm about to do for you and enjoy and maybe we can debate about it. <clears throat> chapter one the characters of the story to observe your mind in an automatic mode, glance at the image below. So there's an image here of a woman. Interesting, figure one. You can pause it if you'd like to see what this bitch looks like. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. She looks like, but to me, she looks furious. So you experience it as you look at the woman's face seamlessly combines what we normally call seeing an intuitive thinking. As surely and quickly as you saw that the young woman's hair is dark. You knew she is angry. Furthermore, what you saw extended in the, into the future. Yeah, that's a good point. It, emotions dictate what we think, what will happen, which is an interesting thing. You sense that this woman is about to say some very unkind words. Uh, yeah, she looks like she's about to say, you stupid asshole. How dare you? Anyway, sorry, kid. Getting... Uh, I'm getting a uh, unfocused yet. You sense that this woman is about to say some very unkind words, probably in a loud and strident voice. A premonition, a premonition of what she was going to do next came to mind automatically and effortlessly. You did not intend to assess her mood or to anticipate what she might do, and your reaction to the picture did not have the feel or something you did it just happened to you it was an instance of fast thinking now look at the following problem 17 times 24 <clears throat> 17 times 24 it's a little bit in the reverse i don't know if it's gonna work in the video you knew immediately that this is a multiplication problem and probably knew that you could solve it yeah i'll probably give me like maybe a minute to someone mathematics would solve that immediately i would like to solve that immediately but i'm not einstein or well, einstein couldn't do that again okay get back to the book you knew immediately that this is a multiplication problem and probably knew that you could solve it with paper and pencil if not without exactly you also had some vague intuitive knowledge of the range of possible results you would be quick to recognize that both 12,609 <sighs> and 123 are implausible without spending some time on the problem. However, you would not be certain that the answer is not 568. A precise solution did not come to mind. And you felt that you could choose whether or not to engage in the computation. If you have not done so yet, you should attempt the multiplication problem now, completing at least part of it. Okay, let's go. Uh, so 17 times 24, 7 times 4. I'm not actually going to do that. Well, <laughs> 7 times 4. <clears throat> times 3 is 21 so 7 times 4 would be 28 so then 28 plus 40 and then 40 plus uh 100 and sorry 40 or whatever oh my god whatever dude i'm skipping this just you figure it out uh, <laughs> you experience slow thinking as you proceed through a sequence of steps. You first received from memory the cognitive program for multiplication that you learned in school, then you implemented it, carrying out the computation was a strain. You felt the burden of holding much material and memory as you need to keep track of where you were and of where you were going while holding on to the intermediate result. The process was mental work, deliberate, effortful, and orderly. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> Prototype of slow thinking. The computation was not only an event in your mind, your body was also involved. Your muscles tensed up, your blood pressure rose, and your heart rate increased. Someone looking closely at your eyes while you tackled the problem would have seen your pupils dilate. Your pupils contracted back to normal size as soon as you ended your work when you found the answer, which is 400. <laughs> By the way, or when you gave up. <laughs> oh, dude, that's hilarious, man. I love this book. This is good. Two systems. 
Psychologists, psychologists have been intensely interested for several decades in the two modes of thinking evoked by the picture of the angry woman and by the multiplication problem and have offered many labels for them. I adopt terms originally proposed by the psychologist Keith Stano, well, Stanovic or Stanovich and Richard West and will refer to two systems in the mind, system one and system two. System one operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. System two allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it, including complex computations. The operations of system two are often associated with the subjective experience of agency, choice, and concentration. The labels of system one and system two are widely used in psychology, but I go further than most in this books, which you can read as a psychodrama with two characters. When we think of ourselves, we identify with system two. The consciousness, the consciousness, right? Oh, sorry, the conscious reasoning self that has beliefs makes choices and decides what to think about and what to do. Although System 2 believes itself to be where the action is, the automatic System 1 is the hero of the book. Yeah, it is. I describe System 1 as an effortlessly originating impressions and feelings that are the main sources of the explicit beliefs and deliberate choices of System 2. The automatic operations operations of System 1. Oh my god, sorry. Can you... <coughs> Talking like this forever is gonna be a struggle. But goddamn, is the reading worth it? <clears throat> okay, the, let me go. When we think of ourselves, we identify with system two, the conscious reasoning self that has beliefs, Make, uh, makes choices and decides what to think about and what to do. Although system two believes itself to be where the action is, the automatic system one is the hero of the book. I describe the system one as effortlessly originating impressions and feelings that are the main sources of the explicit beliefs and deliberate choices of the system two. The automatic operations of system one generate surprising complex patterns of ideas, but only the slower system two can construct thoughts in an orderly series of steps. I also describe circumstances in which system two take over or ruling the freewheeling impulses and associations of system one. <clears throat> You'll be invited to think of the two systems as agents with, the with their individual abilities, limitations, and functions. In rough order of complexity, here are some examples of the automatic activities that are attributed to system one. Detect that one object is more distant than the other. So in rough order of complexity, here are some examples of the automatic activities that are attributed to system one. Detect that one object is more distant than the other. Orient to the source of sudden sound, complete the phrase bread and milk, make a disgust face when shown a horrible picture, detect hostility in a voice, answer to 2 plus 2 equals 4, read works, <clears throat> read words on large billboards, drive a car on an empty road, find strong movement chess if you're a chess master, understand the simple sentences, recognize that a meek and tidy soul with a passion for detail resembles an occupational stereotype. All these mental events belong with the angry woman. They occur automatically and require little or no effort. The capabilities of System One include innate skills that we share with other uh, that we share with other animals. We are born prepared to perceive the world around us, recognize objects, orient attention, avoid losses. There's more, sorry. And fear spiders. <laughs> yeah, fear spiders. Oh, my God. Oh my God. What is this? Talking out loud is not as freaking easy task man oh my god my voice is gonna go bro <clears throat> other mental activities become fast and automatic through prolonged practice system one has learned associations between ideas the capital front it has, it has also learned skills such as reading and understanding nuances of social situations some skills such as finding strong, uh, strong chess moves are acquired only by specialized experts. Others are widely shared, detecting the similarity of personality sketch to an occupational uh, stereotype requires broad knowledge of the language and the culture which most of us possess. The knowledge is stored in memory and is accessed without, without intention and without effort. Okay. Zero of the mental actions in the list are completely involuntary. You cannot refrain from understanding simple sentences in your own language or from orientating to a loud, unexpected sound. Nor can you prevent yourself from knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4 or from thinking of Paris when the capital of France is mentioned. Yeah, that is an interesting thing. I just know Paris because as a kid, mommy and daddy were telling me, you know, 
that's Paris croissants. You know, that's what the first thing that comes up. Other activities such as chewing are susceptible to voluntary control, but normally run on automatic pilot. The control of attention is shared by two systems. Orating to a loud sound is normally an involuntary operation of system one, which immediately mobilizes the voluntary attention of system two. You may be able to resist <clears throat> turning toward the source of a loud and offensive comment at a crowd of party, but even if your head does not move, your attention is initially directed to it at least for a while. However, tension can be moved away from an unwanted focus primarily by focusing intently on the, another target. The highly diverse <clears throat> operations of system two have one feature in common. They require tension and are disrupted when attention is drawn away. Here are some examples. Brace for the starter gun in a race. Focus attention on the clowns in the circus. Focus on the voice of a particular person in a crowded and noisy room. Look for a woman with white hair. Search memory to identify a surprising sound. Maintain a faster walking speed than maintain a faster hold on. Maintain a faster walking speed than is natural for you. Monitor the appropriateness of your behavior in a social situation. Count the occurrences of the letter in a pay in uh, of the letter A in a page of text. Tell someone your phone number. Park in a narrow space for most people except garage attendants. Compared to washing machines for overall value, which I suck at. But by the way. Fill out the tax form, check the valid, the valid, the valid, the valid, the valid, check the valid, I can't even say this word, check the validity, the validity, the validity, I'm going to actually freaking do, welcome Siri, the validity, uh, yeah, I said it right, validity, oh, I'm going to just, you know, Google this shit, hold on, valid, validity the validity the validity the validity hold on give me a second such a freaking weird word to say a weird word validity validity there we go the validity of a complex logical argument in, <clears throat> in all these situations, you must pay attention. Oh my God, dude, the voice is dying. God damn, speaking like this is not a fun thing. Oh my gosh. In all these situations, you must pay attention and you will perform, you will perform less well or not at all. If you're not ready or if your attention is directed inappropriately, inappropriately System 2 has some ability to change the way System 1 works by programming the normally automatic function of attention and memory. When waiting for a relative at a busy train station, for example, you can set yourself at will to look for a white-haired woman <clears throat> or a bearded man, and thereby increase the likelihood of detecting your relative from a distance. You can set your memory to search for capital cities that start with N or for French existing. Ex oh my God. Another tough word. Great. Ex existing. If I cannot. Existentialist novels. Existently. I can't even say it, man. Existentialist novels. <clears throat> uh, and when you rent a car at London's Heathrow Airport, the attendant will probably remind you that we drive on the left side of the road over here. In all these cases, you are asked to do something that does not come naturally and you'll find that the consistent maintenance of said requires continuous exertion of at least some effort. The often used phrase, pay attention and APT, you dispose of a limited budget of attention that you can allocate to activities. And if you try to go beyond your budget, you will fall. It is the mark of effort, effortful activities that they... If, if, <laughs> F for activities that they interfere with each other. Which is why it is difficult or impossible to conduct several at once. You could not compute the product of 17 times 24 while making a left turn into dense traffic. And you certainly should not try. Imagine. 17 times 24. 500 and something. What was it? Oh, God. Uh, it was. I don't even remember, bro. Does anyone recall 528, I think? Which is, oh, it's 400. It's, look at me. Me so smart. Because I read the book. I mean, no, I'm not. I'm just reading. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you can do several things at once, but only if they are easy and undemanding. Undemanding. Oh, that sounds weird. 
undemanding, you are probably safe carrying on a conversation with a passenger while driving on an empty highway and many parents have discovered, perhaps with some guilt, that they can read a story to a child while thinking of something else. Whoa. Can you do that? I mean, yeah, you could. <clears throat> Let me think. Have I done that before? I mean, oh, I don't know. Leave thoughts. Everyone has some awareness of limited capacity of attention. And our social behavior makes allowances for these limitations. When the driver of a car is overtaking a truck on a narrow road, for example, adult passengers quite sensibly stop talking. They know that distracting the driver is not a good idea. That's true. And they also suspect that he is temporarily deaf and will not hear what they say. I've done that before. Intense focusing on a task can make people effectively blind, even to stimuli that normally attract attention. The most dramatic demonstration was offered by Christopher Cabris. Chabris, maybe? Christopher, no, it's Chabris or Cabris. I think it's Christopher Cabris and Daniel Simmons in their book, The Invisible Gorilla. They, const they constructed a short film of two teams passing basketballs, one team wearing white t-shirts, the other wearing black. The viewers of the film were instructed to count the number of passes by, <clears throat> made by the white team, ignoring the black players. This task is difficult and completely absorbing. Halfway through the video, a woman wearing a gorilla suit appears, crosses the court, thumps her chest, and moves on. The gorilla is in view. Oh, this is... The gorilla is in view <clears throat> for nine seconds. Many thousands of people have seen the video, and about half of them do not notice anything unusual. It is the counting task, and especially an instruction to ignore one of teams that causes the blindness. No, no one who watches the video without the task would miss the gorilla. Seeing an orienting or automatic function of System 1, but they depend on the allocation <coughs> of some attention to relevant stimulus. The author notes that the most remarkable observation of their study is that people find find its results very surprising. Indeed, the viewers who failed to see the gorilla are initially sure that it was not there. They cannot imagine missing such a striking event. The gorilla study illustrates two important facts about our minds. We can be blind to the obvious, and we are also blind to our blindness. Yeah, that's deep, brother. Super deep. I like that. I'm going to just repeat it one more time because it sounds so cool. The gorilla study... <clears throat> Uh, now I just screwed that up. <laughs> the gorilla study. The gorilla study illustrates two important facts about our minds. We can be blind to the obvious, and we are also blind to our blindness. Yeah, that's cool. Plot hypnosis. The interaction of two systems is recurrent theme of the book, and brief hypnosis of the plot is in order. In the story, I'll tell systems 1 and 2 are both active whenever we are awake. System 1 runs automatically, and system 2 is, automat is normally in a comfortable low-effort mode, in which only a fraction of its capacity is engaged. System 1 continuously generates suggestions for system 2, impressions, intuitions, inten intentions, and feelings. If endorsed by system 2, Impressions and intuitions turn into beliefs and impulses turn into voluntary actions. When all goes smoothly, which is most of the time, System 2 adopts this, the suggestion of System 1 with a little or no modification. You generally believe your impressions act on your desires, and that is fine, usually. When System 1 runs into difficulty, it calls on System 2 to support more detailed and specific processing that may solve the problem of the moment. System 2 is mobilized when question arises for which system one does not offer an answer as probably happened to you when you encountered the multiplication problem 17 times 24 you can also feel a surge of conscious attention whenever you are surprised system two is activated when an event when an event is detected that violates the model of the world sorry let me repeat that <clears throat> system two is activated when an event is detected that violates the model of the world that system one maintains. In that world, lamps do not jump, cats do not bark, and gorillas do not cross basketball courts. The gorilla experiment demonstrates <clears throat> the, the some attention is needed for the surprising stimulus to be detected. Surprise then activates and orients your attention. You will stare and you will search your memory for a story that makes sense of the surprising event. 
So you will stare and you will search your memory for a story that makes sense of the surprising event. System two is also credited with the continuous monitoring of your own behavior. The control that keeps you polite when you're angry and alert when you're driving at night. System two is mobilized to increase the effort when it detects an error about to be made. Remember a time when you almost blurted out an offensive remark and note how hard you work to restore control. In summary, most of what you, your system two think and do originates in your system one, but system two takes over when things get difficult. And this normally has the last word. That's interesting. The division of labor between system one and system two is highly efficient. It minimizes effort and optimizes performance. The arrangement works well most of the time because system one is generally very good at what it does. It models of familiar situations are accurate. Its short-term predictions are usually accurate as well. And its initial reactions are to challenges are swift and generally appropriate. System one has biases, however, systematic areas that is prone to make in specified circumstances emotion basically as we shall see it sometimes answers easier questions than the one it was asked and it has little understanding of logic and statistic one further limitation of system one is that it cannot be turned off if you're shown a word on the screen in a language you know you'll read it unless your attention is totally focused elsewhere conflict dun 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 figure two is a variant of classic experiment that produces a conflict between the two systems you should try the exercise before reading on so okay so i'm going to show the exercise right here um let's see how that works okay i'm going to keep it like that for a second and then i'm going to maybe is that yeah i think that's less blurry let me go like that i think that's perfect and then i'll just ting ting switch it Okay, <clears throat> figure two is a variant of class experiment that produces a conflict between the two systems. You should try the exercise before reading on. Your first task is to go down both columns, calling out whether each word <clears throat> is printed in lowercase or uppercase. When you're done with the first task, go down both columns again, saying whether each word is printed to the left or to the right of the center. Oh my God, by saying or whispering to yourself left or right. So now I have to go, okay, wait, so you first ask to go down both columns, okay, at the same time, and then each word is printed out in lowercase or in uppercase, okay, understood. When you're done with the first task, <clears throat> so go down with, go down both columns saying whether each word is printed to the left or to the right of the center. If each word Okay, so, 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 so when you are done with the first task, go down both columns, saying whether each word is uh, okay, pr printed to the left or the right of the center by saying or whispering to yourself left or right. Okay, here we go. I've got this, guys. It's going to work out. <clears throat> so, uppercase, lowercase, lowercase, uppercase. Oh, my God. Uppercase. Lowercase, uppercase, lowercase. Okay, now I want to do the other exercise where now I have to say uh, left. Oh, this is tough. So wait, wait, what? So saying, so you have to do it like this. When you are done with the first task, go down both columns and saying whether each word is printed to the left or to the right. Center by saying whispering. Okay. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. Hold on. When you're done with the first task, go down both columns again, seeing whether each word is printed. Ah, uh, the word. So each word, it doesn't matter up or it means left or right. But now, I don't understand. It's, okay, so or to the right of the center by saying or whispering left or right. Um, that's so weird, dude. Am I supposed to do both columns or one column? Go down both columns again, saying whether, when you're done with the first task, go down both columns again, saying whether each word is printed to the left, each word. But there's fucking two words here, okay? Left, right, left. 
right, left, right. I, I mean, I don't. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I don't know. I think we have to follow the big words left, right, left, left, and right, left, right. I don't know. This was a stupid exercise. It doesn't, it's not clear. I hate when I. <clears throat> I'm gonna do it one more time. It says, when you're done with the first task, go down both columns again, saying whether each word is printed to the left. Or to the right. Oh, okay. I don't know, man. This is, this is, this is, I think I have to, oh, aha, I got it. I know what to do. So I have to say, okay, this is left, left, right, 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 left, 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 right, left. Left, right, right, right. Okay, I think I did it. But it took me time, which is, it took me, under, I didn't understand the sentence, so it's a little bit weird. Okay, uh, you were almost certainly successful in saying the correct words in both tasks, and you surely discovered that some parts of each task were much easier than others. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. When you identified the upper and low case, the left-hand column was easy, and the right-hand column caused you to slow down. Let me try that again. So, so, oh, okay, now, what the fuck, that, that's more, okay, so now I have to do it again. So it goes, I got a uppercase, lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, I'm going to go now, aha, uh -huh, okay, I see, <clears throat> lowercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, uppercase, lowercase, and then, you have to decide if it's left or right for both sides. So left, right, left, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, right, right. Okay, I did it. Now I understand what's going on. You're almost certainly successful in saying the correct words in both tasks and you surely discovered that some parts of each task were much easier than others. When you identified upper and lowercase, the left-hand column was easy and the right-hand column caused you to slow down and perhaps to stammer or stumble. I did. I didn't do that. I just did it really badly. <laughs> when you name the position of words, the left-hand column was difficult, and the right-hand column <clears throat> was much easier. When you name the position of words, the left-hand column was difficult, and the right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I, a little bit. These tasks engage system two because saying upper, lower, or right, left is not what you routinely do when you're looking down in a column of words. One of the things you did uh, did to set yourself for the task was to program your memory so that the relevant words up and lower for the first task were on the tip of your tongue. The prioritizing, uh, the prioritizing, the prioritizing of the chosen words is effective and the mild temptation to read other words was fairly easy to resist when you went through the first column. But the second column was different because it continued words for which you were set and you could not ignore them. You were mostly able to respond correctly, but overcome, overcoming the competing response was a strain and slowed you down. You experienced a conflict between a task that you tend to carry out and an, and, and an automatic response that interfered with it. Conflict between an automatic reaction and intention control, it is common in our lives. So conflict between an automatic reaction and an intention to control. Oh, okay, that's interesting. It is a common in our lives. Okay. We are all familiar with the experience of trying not to stare at the oddly dressed couple at the neighboring table in a restaurant. We also know what it's like to force our attention on, on a boring book. When we constantly find ourselves returning to the point at which the reading is lo uh, reading lost its meaning, where winters are hard, many drivers have memories of their cars getting out of control on the ice of the struggle to follow well rehearsed instructions that negate that negate what they would naturally do. Steer into the skid and whatever you do, do not touch the brakes. And every human being has had this experience of not telling someone to go to hell. One of the tasks of the system two is to overcome the impulse of system one. In other words, system two is in charge of self-control. 
illusions to appropriate the autonomy of system one as well as the distinctions between impressions and beliefs take a good look at figure three this picture is unremarkable two horizontal lines of different lengths with appended pointing in different directions the bottom line is obviously longer than the one above it that is what we all see and we naturally believe what we see so here's the weird arrow thing here so i'm looking at it and he said that Ah, oh, interesting. So he says here that the picture is on two horizontal lines of different lengths with fins append, appended, pointing in different directions. The bottom line is obviously longer than the one above it. That is what we all see, and we naturally believe what we see. If you already encountered this image, however, you recognize it is its famous Muller liar illusion, as you can easily confirm by measuring them with a ruler. The horizontal lines are in fact identical in length. How? What? I don't have a ruler, but... Is it? Oh my god, it is! Holy shit! If you put the line down, it's actually the exact line, but in my mind, it's actually... The, the, the arrows make the line look smaller, but it's actually exactly the same size. As you can easily confirm by measuring them with a the ruler, the horizontal lines are in fact identical in length. Now that you've measured the lines, you, your system two, <clears throat> the conscious being you call, I have a new belief. You know that lines are equally long if asked about the length. You'll say what you know, but you'll still see the bottom line is longer. But yeah, it is very strange. You have chosen to believe the measurement, but you cannot prevent the system one from doing its thing. You cannot decide to see the lines as equal, although you know they are. To resist the illusion, there's only one thing you can do. You must learn to mistrust your impressions of length of lines when friends are attached to them. To, your, uh, to implement that rule, you must be able to recognize the illusionary pattern and recall what you know about it. If you can do this, you'll never again be fooled by the Muller lie illusion, but you'll, see, but you'll still see one line is longer than the other. That is actually true because... Yeah, not all illusions are visual. There are illusions of thought, which we call cognitive illusions. As, gradu as a graduate student, I attended some courses on the art and science of psychotherapy. During one of these lectures, our teacher imparted a morsel of clinical wisdom. This is what he told us. You will from time to time meet a patient who shares a disturbing tale, tale of multiple mistakes in his previous treatment. He has been seen by several clinicians and all failed him. <clears throat> the patient can lucidly describe how his therapist misunderstood him, but he has quickly perceived that you are different. You share the same feeling or are convinced that you understand him and will be able to help. <clears throat> At this point, my teacher raised his voice as he said, do not even think of taking on this patient. Throw him out of the office. He's most likely a psychopath and you'll not be able to help him. <clears throat> Many years later, I learned that the teacher had warned us against psychopathic charm and the leading authority in the study of psychopathy confirmed that the teacher's advice that the teacher's advice was sound the analogy of the Mueller lie illusion is close what we were being taught was not how to feel about that patient our teacher took it for granted that the sympathy we would feel for the patient would not be under our control it would arise from system one furthermore we are not being taught to be generally suspicious of our feelings about patients. We were told that a strong attraction to a patient with a repeated history of failed treatment is a danger sign like the fins on the parallel lines. It is an illusion, a cognitive illusion, and system and I, system two, was taught how to recognize it and advise not to believe it or act on it. The question that is most often asked about cognitive illusions is whether they can be overcome. The message of these examples is not encouraging because system one operates automatically and cannot be turned off at will. Errors and in intuitive thought are often difficult to prevent. Biases cannot always be avoided because system two may have no clue to the error. Even when cues to likely errors are available, errors can be prevented only by the enhanced monitoring and effortly activity of system two. As a way to live your life, however, continuous vigilance is not necessarily good and is certainly impractical. I can actually, yeah, that's pretty good advice. That's sound advice. 
Constantly questioning our own thinking would impossibly be tedious, and system two is well impossible is, is is impossible would be impossibly tedious, and system two is much too slow and efficient to serve as a substitute for system one in making routine decisions. The best we can do is compromise. Learn to recognize situations in which mistakes are likely and try harder to avoid significant mistakes when the stakes are high. Good advice. The premise of this book is that it is easier to recognize other people's mistakes than our own. Useful fictions. You have been invited to think of two systems as agents within the mind with their individual personalities. Sorry, let me repeat that one. Useful fictions. You have been invited to think of two systems as agents within the mind with their individual personalities, abilities, and limitations. I will often use sentences in which the systems are the subjects, such as system to calculate the product. The use of such language is considered sin in the professional circles in which I travel because it seems to explain the thoughts and actions of person by thoughts and actions of little people inside the person's head. <clears throat> Grammatically, the sentence about System 2 is similar to the butler, uh, to the butler steals the, the, pa the petty cash. My colleagues would point out that the butler's actions actually explain the disappearance of the cash, and they rightly question whether the sentence about System 2 explains how products are calculated. My answer is that the brief active sentence that attributes calculation to System 2 is intended as a description, not an explanation. It is a meaningful only because of what you already know about System 2. It's shorthand for the following. Mental arith arithmetic is a voluntary activity that requires effort, should not be performed while making a left turn, and is associated with dilated pupils and an accelerated heart rate. Similarly, that the statement the highway driving under routine conditions is left to System 1 means that the steering the car around a bend is automatic and almost effortless. It also implies that an experienced driver can drive on an empty highway while conducting a conversation. Finally, Assistant 2 prevented James from reacting foolishly to the, res to the insult, meaning that James would have been more aggressive in his response if his capacity for effortful control had been disrupted, for example, if he had been drunk. <coughs> System 1 and System 2 are so central to the story, I tell in this book that I must make it absolutely clear that they are fictitious characters. System 1 and System 2 are not systems in the standard sense of entities with, with interacting aspects of parts, and there, is no one, and there is no one part of the brain that either of the systems would call home. You may well ask, what is the point of introducing fict uh, fict uh, fictitious? fictitious? characters with ugly names into a serious book. The answer is that the characters are useful because of some quirks of our minds, yours and mine. A sentence is understood more easily if it describes what an ancient system 2 does if it describes what something is, what properties it has. In other words, system 2 is a better subject for a sentence than mental arithmetic. The mind, especially system 1, appears to have a special aptitude for the construction and interpretation of stories about active agents who have personality habits and abilities. You quickly formed a bad opinion of the thieving butler. You expected more bad behavior from him, and you will remember him for a while. This is also my hope for the language of systems. Why call the name System 1 and System 2 rather than the more descriptive automatic system and effortful system? The reason is simple. Automatic system takes longer to say than System 1 and therefore takes more space in your working memory. This matters because anything that, that occupies your working memory reduces your ability to think. You should treat System 1 and System 2 as nicknames like Bob and Joe, identifying characters that you'll get to know over the course of this book. The fic the fucking that word man, the fictitious system makes it I think I said, fic fictitious. Fictitious. There we go. I said it, the fictitious system make it easier for me to think about judgment and choice and will make it easier for you to understand what I say. Speaking of System 1 System 2, he had an impression, but some of his impressions are illusions. This was a pure System 1 response. She reacted to the threat before she recognized it. This is your System 1 talking. Slow down and let your System 2 take control. He had an impression, but some of his impressions are illusions. But some of his impressions are This was a pure System 1 response. She reacted to the threat before she recognized it. 
All right. This is our system one talking. Slow down and let your system two take control. He had an impression, but some of his impressions are illusions. This was a pure system one response. She reacted to the threat before she recognized it. Oh, but some of the impressions are illusions. Okay, okay, I get it. This is this is your system one talking. Slow down and let okay cool and that is chapter one done please leave your comments and your ideas of what you think of this chapter in the comment section below and please like and subscribe if you like reading maybe you want to insult my reading sometimes i get it it sucks sometimes my mind is fluttering everywhere and it's also late and it's 11:37. So that is chapter one done. See you in the next chapter.